So let me ask you, um, both on both sides of this market, which are highly evolving, uh, which are rapidly evolving, um, talk to us about the state of the art when it comes to commercial and military autonomy. It was a great panel discussion there, and one of the British Army um, folks who was in the panel asked, you know, what happens when everything is destroyed, for example, and the vehicle doesn't know, from a land vehicle perspective, that's, that's certainly a challenge because it's looking for markers that may not be there. Talk to us a little bit about what com where commercial technology is and where military autonomy is going to be in a couple of years. Okay, so if you look at the world of autonomy, most people would think uh, air, air anchored quite a lot of the unmanned systems world work in both military domains and in uh, commercial domains, I prosumer um, domains. Then we arrived at both land and maritime, so we had unmanned surface vessels and we had unmanned robots, land robots. I would say there is a healthy mix between the defence world and the civil world. And I'd say in, throughout the history of time, the civil world and the defence world has taken its turns to then be the creative um, innovator that generates a, a technology that then uh, demonstrates wholesale uptake in one sector or another. Today, we have a very good partnership between commercial world, things like internet, and I'm going to say military world. Where are the challenges going to be? I think our challenges are going to be how to combine the two so that we have something that's affordable, robust, and sustainable. Um, the challenges will also exist in how we leap from one domain to another. There's much to benefit from the commercial world, sensors, Autonomy depends so much on sensors and the civil world and the commercial world spits those out um, readily. The commercial world uh, is spitting out a lot of the artificial intelligence, the likes of Google uh, and others are now producing very refined tools that we can use that might spin out outputs into the military world. So, nice balance. And, and also great accelerations in processing power that allow you to do even more complex things more quickly. Oh, amazing, yes. So if you look at the, the likes of, of companies like Intel and others, they are really putting their, their backs behind uh, the unmanned uh, scenario because advances in computing are going to be the thing that takes it to the next level. Uh, even though I'm a motorhead, I really want a car that's going to drive me to work every day so that I can have a little bit more useful working time. Um, let's talk also about virtual constructive space and how that's um, and simulation space and how that's changing because that every year uh, now you know we were at a conference a little bit um, earlier this uh, earlier this summer I mean just even two months ago and the speed with which the market is moving things that were seen as sort of pie in the sky last year are now things. So where are we going to be? in that space in a few years and how much more realistically, much more economically, but with far greater fidelity, we'll be able to train folks, not just from an air perspective, which has been the first one, but naval, but also increasingly ground, which is among the hardest ones to simulate. So uh, we are accelerating the way that we develop technology, the timescales, and we are closing the loop around new technology, embodying it in our engineering outputs much, much faster. If you look at the way the connected car scene has moved, for example, for very many years, it looked at um, equipments like LiDAR to uh, equipped lorries to do automatic um, lane keeping uh, and collision detection avoidance. Now, with, I'm going to say, much better LiDAR, um, we are just moving at pace. Uh, there is a community of interest, that, so the whole area has gathered a lot of momentum now with more and more young, younger can candidates coming in. I'd say different governments are supporting it also, so treasuries from different countries are investing in this area. So we have an accelerated development path now. Exciting times. Very uh, exciting times. How does it work though? Let me add, because uh, going back to what that uh, British Army uh, officer asked, he said, all right, these systems work very, very well when it has terrain mapping, mm. building mapping, it's got the GPS, so the, the vehicle itself has the sensors, but it's not really looking for where it's going, it's looking for what is impediments in its path. But in a combat scenario, when these buildings are destroyed or damaged or there's more rubble, how, what, is that a big challenge from your standpoint to surmount? Well, the if you look at technology today, you do have certain players that are looking at uh, maps and routes that they already know, so they are looking for features that they're very familiar with. And uh, the examples that we saw, a, a road 
grass verges and trees. If those trees changed and, and they lost their leaves, what would happen? I think that's that's one of the challenges for that technology. On the other side, um, Blue Bear's done this. We go into areas where we know nothing about that terrain and you are on the fly mapping that using either electro-optic cameras or LiDAR so that you can see in the dark and on the fly deciding what your autonomy will do. So it's a, just a matter now of, I'm going to say, the computation power and fidelity of the sensors. So we're already doing, um, moving into terrain that's unknown uh, already. It's a challenge, but it's not insurmountable.